Welcome everyone to today's webinar. I am Brian Zimmerman, Custom Content Editor with Becker Healthcare. We'll begin today's webinar with a presentation and we'll have time at the end of, it, of the session for a question and answer session. You can submit any questions you have throughout the webinar by typing them into your control panel in the space labeled enter a question for staff and clicking send. We are looking forward to hearing your questions. Also, throughout today's webinar, we will have a few poll questions for the audience. The poll questions will pop up directly on your screen, and then you can select your answer from the options and click Submit. Additionally, in about a week following the webinar, we will be sending you a copy of the presentation to the email you used to register. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce today's presenters. Sharon Rojo is a Certified Registered Central Service Technician, a Certified Instrument Specialist, Certified Endoscope Reprocessor, and a Certified Healthcare Leader. He served on the Professional Development Resource Committee for IAHCSMM, as well as the Education Director for the California Central Service Association. Mr. Rojo has 26 years in the sterile processing arena and has a sterile processing technician, SBD educator, an instrument coordinator, and a, surg and a surgical technologist. He is currently on the AAMI working groups for ST79, ST58, and ST91. Mr. Rojo currently teaches the CRCST course for new and existing sterile processing technicians. Mr. Rojo also speaks to local colleges and seminars across the country for numerous organizations such as APIC, AAMA, and AORN on topics related to the pre-op arena, including effective communication and the struggles of sterile processing today. He's a great advocate for nurturing education throughout the United States. Seth Endy is a Clinical Education Coordinator for Healthmark Industries, where he provides clinical expertise on medical device processing, SPD education, and standards. Prior to joining Healthmark, he worked as a central services professional for over 20 years. Responsible for many sterile processing roles, Seth has primarily focused on education for the last eight years, providing continuing education to ensure SPD staff remain certified, and are conversant about the latest trends and requirements of a sterile processing area, and conducting competence verification and documentation activities within the department. Seth is a certified registered central service technician, a certified instrument specialist, a certified endoscope root processor, a certified healthcare leader, and an approved instructor through IHCSMM. Seth is also a certified flexible endoscope root processor through the CBSPD. Seth participates in a number of AAMI sterilization standards work groups, including those responsible for ST79, ST91, and ST90. I will now turn the floor over to Sharon to begin today's presentation. Well, welcome everyone from Seth and I, and hope you're all ready to get shocked today in this educational uh, presentation. And I do want to go over some disclosures. Um, all opinions are those of the presenters today from Seth and I. And this uh, sponsor presentation is not intended to be used as a training guard or promotion. And before using any medical device, um, the ones that we'll be going over today, we want to review any uh, relevant package inserts, warnings, or any step, uh, step by step use of that device, so basically the IFU. On the next slide, we'll be going over um, Healthmark's policy. And really this presentation is about the commitment of educating our customers and making sure that you have the most state of art education as well as what is out there in the market. We are also gonna go over the objectives that we will be uh, performing today. And with the objectives, we're gonna review the FDA's issued warning letter released in November of 2018 on the safety communication on the dangers of monopolar laparoscopic surgery. We're going to identify the different ways insulated instrumentation and devices become damaged. We're going to review recommendations for insulation testing from various standards and guidelines, ARN AMI, um, ARN AMI, AST, and of course, ISO. Discuss medical uh, malpractice from electrical strays from damaged insulated instrumentation devices and describe solutions to um, preventing surgical burns caused by insulation failures as well as fires. And we're gonna take a survey right off the bat on our next slide. So our first survey question today, uh, we'd like to see who's, who's attending. So 
we've got who is attending today, and our answers are SPD professional, OR professional, infection prevention professional, endoscopy professional, or other professional. And it looks like we've got a pretty good mix today with uh, other professionals and SPD professionals making up the bulk of the group. And great that we have a kind of a well-rounded uh, group there. Um, I really want to recognize our IP professionals um, and thank you for joining um, this uh, educational webinar because you know you really make a difference in helping our SPD teams and OR teams and so happy to hear that you're um, on board with this to help us in this um, uh, presentation and this issue really. Before we really get into everything, I want to make sure we have some definitions because we are going to say a few things that maybe you're familiar with or you're not familiar with. Electrosurgery, um, you'll hear, um, is using high frequency electric current to heat and cut tissue with great precision. Um, MIS is abbreviation for minimally invasive surgery. Monopolar and bipolar, you hear this a lot with the instrumentation. Um, so monopolar is basically the current that passes through the patient to return a pad and then back to the generator, the ESU generator to complete that circuit. Your bipolar is gonna be the electric current passing from one side of the forcepper instrument through the target tissue to the other side of that forcepper instrument and then back to the generator. So really what we're gonna be discussing on this next slide is why must I test insulated devices? Really what it comes down to is our patient. It's patient, it's our, it's our staff or the individuals in the surgical uh, procedure itself with burns and electrical straight currents that cause that. Possible fires in the OR, um, that can also happen. And with limited view of the surgical um, team only views basically about 10% of that um, screen um, and really most of those um, are just going to be at the distal end of that device and we're going to go into showing some pictures later on. There's many different types of insulated instruments and devices to be tested and we have to remember this is not focused just on laparoscopic. We're going to go into other instruments that we need to be aware of and ARN does state that um, in state that the injury to staff members and patients as well as fires is an issue. Now we're gonna go into some data. You know, what's, what's going on out there um, in the United States and uh, worldwide? There are over 3 million laparoscopic procedures done annually in the United States. And worldwide, it is actually more than 7.5 million. And this is including a, a variety of procedures, your cholecystectomies, your apodectomies, hernia repair, bowel resection, and such. Approximately 5.4% of these operations will have unintentional tissue burns. That comes out to four of 405,000 patients will have a burn. Of over 192,000 laparoscopic procedures identified in California and Florida, resulted in 3.6% of those thousand cases of patients' uh, morbidity and mortality, which were likely related to straight energy burns during the laparoscopic procedure. We're gonna go on to some more data here. One study showed that one in four patients who suffer internal injuries from stray burns die. One in five reusable laparoscopic instruments has insulation failures with the most common failure at the side of that disco, uh, distal third of that instrument. Now moving on, insulation failures cited as being the primary cause of burns during laparoscopic procedures. 90% of the instrument is not visualized by the surgeon or the surgical team in the room. 67% of stray electrical burns go unnoticed during that procedure. 25% of patients who suffer internal injuries stemming from these burns during laparoscopic, uh, laparoscopic procedures die. So going on, the New York Times actually had an article here, and this is a good picture to describe that, a burn or stray that's circled there on an insulation failure of the electrical instrument. And as you can see here, that's out of that 10% range that would be seen during that procedure. No one would ever know. And this is scary because patients can um, go in one day for a laparoscopic procedure and three, day late, three days to four days later come back with issues with vomiting and fever to find out they actually have burns or adhe adhesions and such um, with that remaining um, surrounding tissue that wasn't basically the targeted tissue. 
The FDA um, came out with a warning letter in 2018 saying that evidence shows that a patient um, is injured by capacitive uh, coupling, uh, which we're really not going to be talking about today, which is basically another instrument um, during the procedure that can be electrically charged or interoperative um, installation failures every 90 minutes in the United States. That's high. So basically every 90 minutes in the USA, there's going to be a burn. We're gonna go on to look at, um, I did some research of what's going out there with lawsuit, what's, what's happening. And here I found one with the Da Vinci robot lawsuit. And basically a, Bro a Bronx resident who filed a Da Vinci robot lawsuit after his 24-year-old daughter died following robotic surgery. Now, basically, she died of small bowel injuries, claiming the robot's equipment lacked sufficient insulation. A study in 2011 showing that some forms of insulation failed on the Da Vinci robot, robot as much as four times the rate of conventional, uh, conventional surgical equipment. The Cancer Center reported three cases of artery burns resulting from poor insulation on the robot. And this is scary. So going on, we want to uh, look at considering when purchasing an insulation tester, what am I looking for? What is out there? What if I already have one? What do I do about that? And what questions do I ask with, you know, a variety of, um, uh, of just accessories and such? So we're gonna break this down. So really, what kind of insulated instrumentation in your inventory will be testing? That's really the first question. What do you have that needs to be tested? Again, we cannot just focus on laparoscopic. As you see in the previous lawsuit, we're looking at robotics. We're also looking at bipolar forceps, bipolar scissors, bipolar monopolar cords, and a variety of other instrumentation that need to be tested. Now, is it a plug-in? battery operated or even or both what is the usage without recharging how long basically does it last i know of one that lasts about 15 hours without charging but that is a good question because what if it doesn't last does it even have an alarm to even tell you if it needs to be charged also consistent voltage in the delivery until the battery dies does that mean it loses its charge halfway through what does that look like Usually less than 2.6 volts um, shows less faults in the instrument device you are testing. Um, is there a signal to know how much time is left before the battery needs to be recharged? Is there like a green light to a blue light and a signal that can not, basically not use the tester until it's recharged? Sort of like your cell phone, right? Does it have some signifier that says that I'm halfway or at 30%? What kind of battery is being used? Because regular batteries do lose their charge over time and detect less faults. And by the time the battery is half or um, basically half um, charged, um, faults may not be able to be detected or missed. Is it portable or is it fixed standalone? Having the installation tester accessible to where um, you are working equals basically in my eyes more compliance. If the tester is a fixed unit, can it be on a mobile car or be moved around in each, work, um, in each workstation? So when I've traveled around, Seth and I go around different facilities, we do see typically one department will have one to two. Um, and they'll have about eight workstations. And, you know, that's really hard because what if, you know, a couple of technicians are doing laparoscopic um, instrumentation? Are they sharing? Are they taking turns? But again, we see more compliance when there is an installation tester per workstation. But of course, cost is the factor. So as long as you have installation testers available on a mobile cart that can be moved to the station and having more than one for sure um, is really good. Are you able to adjust the voltage or how sensitive is your tester? Understand that some testers come with a standard voltage, maybe just pushing a button and cannot be adjusted versus some testers, you will have to uh, adjust the voltage depending on the type of accessory that you're using. For example, using something that has like a tri-hole that has three different sizes of holes, maybe that needs to be um, adjusted to a 4.2 volt for a particular tester. You always wanna to refer to the IFU of that vendor for the tester to make sure um, you're using the right voltage for the accessory because it may not be enough and you're not gonna be, you're gonna be missing basically failures in your device. Now, more things to consider um, to continue with that. 
is remember that insulated instruments and devices are not just for laparoscop uh, laparoscopic, like we noted. You have robotics, you have bipolar cords and forceps. Ask what accessories that the tester in question comes with to be able to test a wide variety of instruments and devices and if they are user friendly. I've already ran into situations where I've used, used some testers out there that the they had the correct accessories, but they were so cumbersome to use. And I kept dropping the instrument or the grounding wire kept falling off. And you have to remember that quality doesn't cost, it pays. Don't let the price that's a low price or free override the quality. We're also going to be looking at insulation is a temporary coating that retains the electrical current within the instrument. But remember, it is not just a temporary coating, it's delicate, very delicate. What I'm seeing now when I go to facilities is I'm seeing that every care is taken every step of the way. And Seth will be talking about that in more detail about transport and about testing all your instruments and such. But what I see is all this care is taken into the devices and then they're put in with metal instrumentation, which Seth will talk about. And then I see damage from there. So you can test for damage and replace items, but then they could be redamaged in the tray once it goes and uh, after it's wrapped and, be, and sterilized. So just understand that. Defects must be discovered during laparoscopic instrument set assembly, or depending on the type of insulation tester it, um, you have, it could have sterile wands with it where the checking is done prior to the procedure. And of course, depending on your facility's policy. Electricity can escape through the holes in causing burns, infections, and extended recovery time. And the smaller the leak, the worse the burn because, the because it concentrates basically in that stray. The IFU of the device may state you need to test every time. Examples of IFUs for insulated instrumentation devices um, are going to be on the next few, uh, next few slides. Now, examples of IFUs. Now, I could have went and give you a huge list of IFUs. And again, I will remind you that these are just little sections of these IFUs. But I thought these were important to show you what is out there. So the first one was spectrum laparoscopic instrumentation. And it says in here, report and note, at this point in the process, spectrum recommends testing the insulation for cracks, gaps, where the shaft meets the tip assembly, and pinholes. And really, I put a note in here, this IFU does not come out in state every use, but how the IFU reads is basically after the decontam process, which is basically every instrument used. But again, I encourage everyone to go back and look at the few, um, the whole IFU for these devices. The next bullet here is your ASSI, your accurate surgical instrumentation. And we're, what we're talking about here is a bipolar scissor. Now it states, recommends establishing a uh, procedural review by which the instrumentation are inspected frequently before and after each use. Now here is defining exactly when. For damage at, uh, such as, um, and here it says under bullet three, for insulated instruments, cracks, nicks, uh, lacerations, or abrasions in the insulation. V. Mueller, um, the bipolar jeweler forceps. Prior to use, you want to expect the device to ensure proper function and condition and do not use devices if they do not basically are not satisf uh, satisfactory um, and intended um, function or if they have physical damage. Now, moving on, there's some more examples of IFUs, but I want to expand on the V. Mueller bipolar jeweler forceps <clears throat> because as I was reading down, I found this section saying adverse events reported while using bipolar electrosurgical uh, devices include, and if you look here on the second and third bullets, fires involving surgical drapes and other combustible materials. This was actually one of the first IFUs that I ran across that actually noted this. Then it also uh, went on to say alternate current pathways resulting in burns where the patient or physician or assistant is in contact with those uh, with exposed metal. And really uh, moving on, we want to look at the many types and the models used to test insulation um, because they are out there. Um, if you had um, or if you were able to go to the ISHM convention this uh, last couple of weeks in Anaheim, wow, it was a great vendor exhibit um, going around and looking at all of these insulation testers. And they had a lot. But things that you really need to keep in mind is that 
you know, just understand that some installation testing units may not be purchased right off the bat. You may have to basically um, go with their repair service through the vendor to, um, to actually purchase uh, the tester. And that's absolutely fine, but just understand that some testers that are out there, you have to have that repair service through them. Some repair vendors may provide an insulated tester to the customer at no cost, but make sure the tester meets your instrument device inventory, as well as your staff's educational needs for the unit. With that tester, for an example, if you have a tester that just tests laparoscopic, but you have bipolar forceps or cords, how is that going to be done? So something that you need to consider. Also, the insulation tester might need PMs or some type of preventive maintenance, like a yearly calibration. Does the tester need to be sent back to the vendor for this maintenance or to your um, hospital's biomedical department? So that's something that you would have to investigate and see. And if it's sent out and that's your only one, do they provide a loaner? So something else to ask. We're gonna now gonna go on to a, another survey. So our next question here is, what brand or vendor of insulation tester do you use? Please check all that apply. IMS, Steris, McGann, Spectrum, Mobile, or other? Again, a pretty good mix there, but uh, it looks like IMS, Steris, and other are the most common responses. Yeah, and this is good. This is kind of typically what we see, Seth and I, around the country, a variety of, of testers. But again, you know, you, making sure that the tester that you do have just meets the needs of your instrument inventory. So great. So now what we're going to look at is now that you looked at a tester, the other thing that you need to consider is what accessories does the tester provide? Because that is, to me, the most important question. Because you can have a tester, but what kind of accessories does it have or how many? What is included in the kit or package with accessories? What additional accessories will have to be purchased separately? So understand you may get a kit, but it may not have all the accessories with it. How to identify damage of accessories? This is something recently, I was at a couple of facilities and they had, they were testing every instrument every time. They had a great insulation tester. They had the right accessories for their inventory, but the in, but the um, accessories were actually damaged, and one of them, no one really knew. So make sure you get educated by the vendor of the tester of what um, damage looks like for the accessories. Another thing I do see is, and it's pretty obvious, is that the grounding wire can become damaged a lot quicker than your accessories because you're using it every time to ground. Understand that you cannot just take uh, color code tape or a tape in general to just wrap around that exposure. That does need to be dealt with because you um, could be a safety issue or a fire. So you want to make sure you let your SPD leadership know when um, the grounding wire does become damaged and make sure you remedy that situation. The other thing that I recommend with accessories is make sure you have a backup of uh, accessories as well and your grounding wire. So you, if you have one insulation tester, which is better to have more than one, um, you're not left with not testing left, uh, no, excuse me, all your insulated instruments, excuse me, um, and you're left not being, being able to do that, that you do have a backup um, to be able to get that in circulation. You want to make sure that the accessories that you do have have direct contact with um, the instruments that you are testing. And does it have um, some type of alarm or some kind of a visual or something that you could hear um, when there is damage detected? You also want to make sure that you're using your accessories correctly and making sure that, for an example, uh, if I have a three millimeter laparoscopic instrument, that I'm not using it inside of a hole in an accessory in a five millimeter because you really have to have direct contact all the way around that instrument. How are the accessories replaced if they be, uh, do become damaged? Are they free? Do they repair them or are they replaced with the cost? You really have to make sure you ask those questions up front because you don't want to have a damaged accessory that you're not dealing with and you're, keep, you're actually keep on using it, but you're not asking these questions when you purchase your tester to say, you know what, um, I guess we will have to replace this uh, with no cost or guess what, we do have to buy this other one as well. 
Will education and in-servicing be provided by the vendor? That's a really good question because you know what? You can buy this latest and greatest technology and have all these accessories, but guess what? If you don't know how to use it <laughs> or you're not reading the IFU, um, you can do uh, some damage uh, for yourself you can, um, or you can actually not test correctly. Are the IFUs accessible if they're lost? Are they online? Are they in a CD? Are they on paper or are they in all three? So again, questions to ask in regards to the IFU and also education and ongoing education is critical. You can have on-site um, in your initial in-servicing, but again, with turnover with staff and leadership changes, you always wanna make sure it's ongoing. So again, going on with accessories are important. What and how are they used? Do the accessories have multiple uses for different instrumentation devices? Because you could have an accessory that could be used for multiple things. Are they user friendly? So for an example, if you have two hands that are used, um, this actually increased the risk of getting shock versus using one hand. Um, so considering something with a fixed block, like you see here that I circled, or a test unit, like you see in the bottom middle there, that it's fixed and the instrument actually goes on the tester itself. Um, as well as being uh, easy to perform this task, as well as being quicker. Because usually what I hear out there, Seth and I, uh, we do ask the questions, you know, why aren't you testing every time? Or why is this happening? Or why are you using this particular accessory? Um, what we do get a lot of is, well, it's not quick enough. This is cumbersome. This is, we have turnovers. We have, um, we have, we don't have that many in inventory with sets, so we can't do it every time. And that should not be done. You want to make sure that you have the right testers. You have the enough, enough testers, as well as the right accessories again for that inventory. Are there multiple ways to use the accessories? Again, making sure that you have enough uh, accessories and they can be used for multiple things. And now we're going to go on to another survey. So our next question here is, what test electrode accessory do you use most often? Wand five millimeter, 10 millimeter, wand three millimeter, five millimeter, 10 millimeter, ring with internal brush, single brush, or hook? Looks like uh, the top three options were the most selected there with wand uh, five millimeter, 10 millimeter as the most common answer. And this is typically, this number is pretty good because this is typically what Seth and I see across the country um, with the type of accessories being used. So good. So going on, I added this picture. I thought this was funny. I don't know where I saw this, whether it's on Facebook or on those sterile processing groups that are out there on Instagram. Watching a coworker test lap instrumentation without wearing gloves. I think we should have did a survey. I forgot to ask that. Uh, we should have did a survey on this because I know I've shocked myself numerous times because guess what? I wasn't following the IFU. So one thing to consider is does the IFU state that you have to wear gloves um, when testing um, your instrumentation devices? But I thought this was funny. So going on to many type of accessories to test insulated um, instrument and devices. So I took this picture to kind of show you just an example of a unit that would have different accessories. And understanding how to use them, the right voltage, um, do they interchange, does it have a fixed block of some kind where you can put the other accessories in there to make it easier to test with one hand. One of the things that I wanted to point out, and again, we're not here to advertise, what we're here is to show you what's out in the market. I know with ISHAM and other um, organizations that I go to their conventions, I walk around and I see what's out there. And the latest and greatest things that I was excited about, and I know Seth was too, was something that I didn't know existed was a bipolar cable cord. And basically, um, it has three different diameters uh, to pull through your cables and cords, which makes it easier to test instead of just using a brush that you have to, which takes a long time because a brush you have to go on all sides of that uh, cord or cable. So this actually just pushes down, you put the cord in the right diameter and you just string it through. I think that's awesome. The other thing that we saw in our travels is uh, a new bipolar forcep accessory, or basically the bipolar forcep goes into um, that little piece, that copper piece there, and it just fits in there into a fixed block, and then you hook up your uh, your brush, and you just go over, um, you wanna make sure you're doing it correctly, going over each side 
full length of that bipolar forcep. And again, this is great because typically you just have a brush to do that and you're having to struggle with two hands. So this is great having that kind of stuff out there in the market. I also want to go over um, in this next slide examples of uh, damage insulation devices recently that I took. And uh, depending how you logged in, you may or may not be able to hear um, these videos. So if you're able to hear these videos, that's great. But let me explain the situation on these pictures. So in the first video, um, that instrument had more damage towards, uh, towards that distal tip pretty close to where it would basically go off because obviously you're close to that piece that's exposed, but it was caught there. The second video was pretty obvious. Um, it was visually obvious that there was damage, but again, it was just showing an example of the right um, port basically to use in this accessory. The last video here, as you notice, we're testing a cord and we're testing it. We didn't have that new little latest and greatest uh, cable cord uh, pull through. We had a brush, but even doing so, um, doing it, I, I think it took a, a little bit to go through each sides of that cord. We actually found a break um, in the middle of that cord. And typically when there's damages with your cords, um, this will happen because they hang off the drape onto the floor at times and during the procedure. And you have a lot of equipment during that case that could roll over on the cable or you have uh, foot stools and such um, that you know can raise an individual to that procedure height and that can actually get caught in there and damage it. So there's so many different ways. The other thing that you need to be aware of with cords is that they do tend to have damage a lot on the distal and proximal end, basically the two areas where they plug in. The main area is where it plugs into the generator. That I see a lot of damage only because the way the team is pulling them, they're not going in and grabbing the whole piece to pull out, they're yanking the cord to pull it out. So understand that a lot of the damage can actually happen at that proximal end. Now we're gonna go ahead and take another survey. So our next question is, how many insulation testers does your department facility currently own? One, two to three, four to five, or five plus? And it looks like most folks got, have one right now. And that's typical, Seth, and I do see that <laughs> kind of in line with what we're seeing. But again, like I talked about is if you're gonna have one, you need, really need to purchase at least two, but have them mobile on carts or something where it can go to the workstations. But you know, ideally, you should have them at each workstation because you'll actually have more compliance with uh, testing. I also want to go over in, uh, some more examples um, that I recently uh, taken. And with these, uh, these examples, again, are examples of damage. And this video here, um, hopefully you're able to hear. And if not, you can see that little electrical stray. And that is really close to that distal tip. And again, you can see it. Um, kind of going off there. Now in the next video, um, this one here was more on the proximal end towards that handle, as you can see that little electrical stray as well. What I wanna um, stress is that these two instruments, and let's go on to the next slide, are the same two instruments you see here. So I did something kind of creative. I decided to bring a borescope with me at these facilities and actually look at where the break was to see what was really going on because on one of the instruments, the one on the left, I didn't feel a difference. I couldn't see anything, but obviously the installation tester picked something up. And with using the borescope on this, I found this little gash. The second instrument on the right, this one, I didn't visually see this, but guess what? I did feel a little nick of some kind, but again, we're using the borescope. I was actually just, you can see the exposed metal with that. Now we're gonna turn um, the next half of the presentation to Seth and talk about who says what? What are the recommendations? And what about different examples of transport and setup of your trays? Very good, thank you, Sharon. Um, again, my name is Seth Hendy, and um, we're just here to talk about um, uh, laparoscopic accessories. Who's making, my part is, is about who's making the recommendations and, and where do we see that coming from? So I had an example of an IFU uh, myself. Um, 
because some IFUs don't recommend a tester. And I would actually say, if you want to click again, uh, and then one more time, these are straight from the IFU. And the example Sharon gave were the same uh, to say that these instruments must work well. They have to contain that current, but of all of them that, that we've seen so far, uh, none of them had said, use a machine to do this testing find an insulation tester or or something to that effect we all know and they're making very sure to talk to you about what the dangers are if damage occurs uh, but they're not always out suggesting specifically that there's a machine to test for these functions um, so you know what do you do where where do you go when when the ifu doesn't make a suggestion and we're going to talk in the next slide about the uh organizations out there that are making recommendations that let us go back to our facility and say i, I need one of these testers i i need i need a machine i need uh, some way to take what can be a slightly subjective um, test, if you ask me, looking just visually inspecting with the naked eye and by feel for cracks uh, is, is a little subjective. I may not believe that a crack or a dent is something that um, can cause an electrical stray, uh, but there are uh, totally objective ways to go out there and actually use it. And um, uh, although we couldn't, um, if you had called in on the phone, you couldn't hear the audible sound from the tester on the videos that Sharon showed. There's also an indicator light. So those machines are great because they have more than one way of showing you uh, completely objectively, this is working properly. So uh, AORN uh, and uh, ST79 have some, some fairly simple statements. Um, insulated devices should be visually examined and tested using equipment to design to, to, uh, to detect insulation failures. So there's actually a recommendation that doesn't just say cracks, dents, uh, defects. It actually says that you should uh, get a piece of testing equipment designed for it. Uh, SD79 does not have any specific uh, information on insulated items. Uh, but do recommend visual inspection uh, for defects. So uh, I'm, I'm really proud of AORN for being a place that says there's machines to do this and we should get out there and we should be looking. Um, and as far as SD79 goes, we see so much harmonization now. Um, I hope that uh, in the near future, you'll see uh, Amy come out with a statement uh, to, to be able to use a tester and, and use a piece of equipment uh, to make this work. Uh, let's look at a few more recommendations. So now we're going to switch to AST. Um, insulation failure is now considered the primary cause of laparoscopic electrical injuries. Uh, if the insulation is comprised, um, is compromised, such as a crack or a hole, the electrical current can escape at the, uh, at the point and burn untargeted tissue. And I'm saving it until the end, but we have a, an example that as soon as you see it, you're, you know, you really truly get the point that they can't be seen all the time and that damage can happen um, before anybody knows. Uh, so we'll go to the next slide here. And AST even begins to suggest where that inspection should be done. Now, Sharon had referred to earlier, and if if a hospital institutes a policy where a, a sterile wand is used and they are available, uh, that is a way to try to address the problem that, that Sharon spoke to early on. What if we do some testing and then the instruments could be damaged between when they're tested in the CS department and when they uh, are used in surgery? And so there are organizations that put that into their policy and there are uh, testers out there that can be used sterilely. And then that would be uh, knowing how your instrument was going to function immediately uh, before it is used. So uh, we're actually going to go through the following uh, five-step recommendation method uh, by AST. 
so first visual inspection of the instrument uh, prior to completing the co uh, cleaning process. Uh, instruments and electrodes with cracks or holes in the insulation should be removed from service and sent for reinsulation and repair. It's a good idea. Uh, instruments or electrodes should be cleaned with a soft, bristle, non-abrasive uh, cleaning agent. Absolutely. Those things will damage the insulation we're trying so hard to protect. Uh, the, and the reason I highlighted this um, is exactly the reason Sharon mentioned a boroscope. A microscope should be used to visualize the integrity of the insulation of each item. I've seen a lot of tabletop magnif magnifiers out there, a lot of lighted magnification, which is great, something we absolutely need. Uh, that will not take you as close as a microscope or as Sharon did uh, with the boroscope. And that is actually just a, a very um, interesting thought. What tools do you have to be able to enhance your visual inspection as well? Uh, lighted so that lighted magnification might just not be good enough. Uh, let's do D and E, their last two steps. Uh, insulation scanner should be used to detect the release of stray electrical energy along the length of the insulation. So here we have again another uh, organization, best practice recommendation organization saying not only are we checking visually, but uh, there are scanners and testers out there that can do a really good job. Um, instruments and electrodes are securely packaged for sterilization and the items should be packaged in such a manner to minimize movement during handling in order to prevent damage to the insulation. Exactly what uh, Sharon said and we're actually going to have some examples of that coming up. Okay, uh, we'll take our last step, which is uh, again back to Amy with ST90, but also with ISO. And both of these are going to be recommendations about quality. ST90 is, is the um, <clears throat> Amy quality document, and ISO produces quality documents for all sorts of things. Uh, so between ST90 and ISO 13485, um, with a major focus on quality, the PQ, of IQ, OQ, PQ is performance qualification. So demonstrating that the process is consistently producing acceptable quality, uh, the user usually performs this, which is verifying. So a quality measure of the insulation on an insulated instrument is to contain the current, is to direct it into one specific place, which is the distal tip, and to use it. So for that instrument to perform properly, then somewhere along the line, we have to come in and say, okay, I have made sure that no stray current can leak out of any point at this instrument uh, that, that, I, um, that I don't want it to. Um, it can also be uh, an interesting thing to think about as, as far, it's not installation qualification exactly, but after repairs, and a lot of times uh, we, we think that, we think about uh, endoscopes. Oh, it just came back from a repair. It must be fine and it must be perfect. I, I just sent it out for repair. Um, Sharon and I have seen a few um, laparoscopic instruments that were uh, a little short, two millimeters short of the distal tip. And it may not seem like very much, but that is a humongous gap as far as stray current and voltage is concerned. And so even, um, even your repaired laparoscopic instruments should be checked to make sure that they're going to perform the way you want them to. And again, that's not exactly an installation qualification. That's more of an equipment sort of thing. But I like to think about it that way. Just because something has come back from repair does not mean that it's ready to go. Just because it comes out of your extras drawer doesn't mean that it's ready to go. And we, need, we always need to be thinking about those things. All right, let's take a look at some pictures here. So uh, my first example in this slide is um, someone trying to do right by their laparoscopic instruments. So we see an example of someone attempting to properly transport the insulated instruments. They have been separated mostly from the other uh, instruments, but um, I still think that there's a few items in there that could do damage to that insulation. So this is good, 
it is not as good as it could be. So let's take a look at another example. So here we see uh, instruments fully isolated and immobilized to prevent damage and uh, a holding tray, a re the really appropriate holding tray for your laparoscopic instruments is what you need. Because if they can't hold, separate, and segregate these items, then the damage just increases uh, through handling. Let's take a look at another good one. There you go. Uh, another perfect example, uh, a, a, a different kind of tray, but uh, set up to hold laparoscopic instruments and to hold them apart and protect your insulation, which we love. Um, so what about some not so good examples? Well, there you have it. That's, uh, this is a not a good example for the lap items in the bottom. Really, it's not a good example for that rigid endoscope or for the camera either. Uh, you know, we, we don't have to worry about stray electricity through cameras, but, but nicking or cutting a camera cord uh, can cause a bunch of damage. And that's not really what, uh, what we want to transport any of our items that way. We'll look at another. Yep. So here, an uh, example of a rack. Uh, we know does a good job of protecting these. So if you're looking at it, you can see that that is a laparoscopic rack set up to hold these instruments and uh, to separate them, but it's not being used properly, not even close really. Uh, most of the instruments that are actually placed are all the metal ones, which don't need to be protected as much. And most of the ones that are on top and at most risk are all the, uh, the insulated ones. This is really also a safety hazard for the person unloading the cart. Uh, those instruments are poised to fall. Um, so that's, you know, that's a sharp hazard in itself. And if they fall to the ground or to the inside of the case cart, then they certainly are going to be damaged. We'll take a look at, at our next one, which is just a close up. You know, we don't always see instruments you know, all, all together from, from this level. Once we get them individually, we start looking at them very closely. Uh, but I just wanted to show an example here of, of close up. You can see the layering that can happen here and how many edges are just looking to nick and scratch those insulated instruments. We'll take a look at the next one, which is just a pullback. And again, that's what I said, you know, sometimes when you look at them at this level, it doesn't seem so bad. And that's where the contrast came from uh, looking, getting a little closer and seeing just how much um, potential for damage there is out there. Uh, so y these are just uh, examples. I'm hoping that the places that are transporting these these uh, insulated items this way have a good testing program because the every time these instruments are used uh, and transported in this way they're they have a large potential to be damaged okay so that was my last picture uh, now we'll we'll talk about some other things um, Sharon has already laid out you know those stats burns happen far far too often um they are difficult to detect while the procedure is underway and once the damage uh, is done it can lead to serious complications or death um so and then complications from internal burns can put the patient in life-threatening condition um even with antibiotic therapy uh, about 33 percent of patients who um develop peritonesis uh don't survive Laparoscopy is one of the most common procedures resulting in medical malpractice. So if, if we can do anything to, to make that better, why wouldn't we, right? How, how, how are we not trying to do that? Okay, uh, we'll go to the next slide. Uh, okay, so here's an a outpatient surgery uh, journal was uh, posting a, an article. Um, stray electrical energy occurring outside this field of view can cause unintended burns to non-target tissues, and these burns usually go unnoticed. And so there should be a video that plays next, and this will bring it home for you if you've never seen it.
and you see it right there. So now that we've pulled back, if, if this camera shot had not pulled back from where they're usually looking, which is much closer that way, you know, you want, you, we need to be looking at that tip. That's where we expect all the uh, cauterizing uh, and cutting to be happening. And so there are times where the camera does not pull back and does not pan back and that, um, that hole that nick, whatever it is right there that is allowing that current to get out is causing unintended damage. Okay, that was, was enough of that. We, you know, those are the things we got, we have to see. You have to, sometimes you have to see them to really understand what's happening out there and why it is so important to do some of the things we do and why the recommendation organizations where I first started are some of the, the people out front saying, we have to be looking for this and we have to be looking to stop it whenever possible. Uh, I'm gonna say the same thing that Sharon said, uh, quality doesn't cost, it pays. Um, any expense incurred in time or equipment investment will cost less than the 551,891 uh, for a single burn. And this is not the, the biggest thing. There, there, are, there are larger cash awards out there. Um, so that was, you know, just another example of uh, how, you know, how you can impact someone's life. And then when they start talking about pain and suffering, some of those other things, that's because some of these are conditions or, you know, they change your health for, for the rest of your life. And that's something we need to be avoiding. Okay, one more, next slide. <clears throat> okay. Patients seem to appear to experience a normal recovery during the first few days. However, within three to seven days, complications, fever, nausea, vomiting uh, may take place. This often requires an exploratory laparotomy to find the cause. It may then be discovered the internal organs were burned uh, during the procedure. Um, I just, I know this is a more of a, a doctor nurse uh, thing, but I, I love the statement, uh, do no harm, right? That's the greatest philosophy in medicine, if you ask me. Um, so do you think that means do no harm that you know of or that you know of right now? We know that's not true. You can't think about it that way. Um, the hours or days between the initial procedure uh, and burn to the diagnosis of the issue uh, is too long for some people, and that's where we've seen examples of, of sepsis and, and death. Okay, our, <clears throat> right, our little slide here, that, and when I said that there were more and larger settlements, a woman was awarded 2.8 million in a medical malpractice case uh, due to an unintentional surgical burn. And here again is another example of where we expected the current to be coming out of, which is all the way to the left, and where a burn that was not supposed to happen uh, took place. So, and simple solutions exist to stop this problem altogether. Uh, inspecting these instruments beyond just sight and touch can not only save money, it can truly save a life. Okay, um, the sterile processing department is a detailed and dynamic arena. The sterile processing professional today has to be knowledgeable, motivated, uh, motivated, and innovative. Certification and continuing education is essential to survive this ever-changing, fast-paced environment. And I would just say, if you're out there and you're a CS person, be proud. I, I was, I worked in a, in a CS for 20 years and I was very proud. Uh, I tried to just engage in every process that I was doing as if I knew the person that those instruments were gonna be used on. And when you do that, uh, taking the, the time um, to, to make these things happen and, and making the investment in the equipment is well worth it. And I want to add to Seth's um, statement as well. You know, Seth and I, you know, worked really hard in trying to get this, you know, realistic and really trying to show everyone that's attended that what's really happening today in SPDs. And really the two things that I want everybody to take back with them is that if you currently have a installation tester, 
please go back after this webinar and look at your accessories, see if they're damaged, see if it's working, um, find out when the last PM was done. And if you do not um, have an installation tester, and you're not testing, we really hope that after this, you will do your due diligence and shop around for uh, an installation tester that meets your inventory needs. So, and exactly, and I'm and, and I would say, you know, look at your policy. Your inspection policy has to reflect what you're going to do, and which is how often um, that that other equipment, other than than just visual inspection, is going to be used, and. Um, once you put that in your policy, then it's time to stick to it. Then it's time to, to make sure your techs have the time uh, or the inventory to be able to test. There was just a couple of slides here that we close off with if you want to. Those were my final thoughts. Um, we just want you to know we've got uh, education out there that's free and, and hopefully entertaining to all. So if you ever get the chance, uh, go to our Crazy for Clean games, and then, of course, uh, Queen of Quality is our newest one. Um, and then, of course, we also sponsor Decontaminator of the Year. Uh, Sharon had mentioned that. Um, what, what just had mentioned Isham. Uh, it, it's great. I love participating in this um, because, you know, we're, we're trying to get out there and, and say it's a, it's a great profession. Uh, it's a great line of work to get into, and uh, we want to support wherever we can. That's it, right? Were we taking questions? Thank you, questions? Professor Sharon. Yep. Uh, we will now begin today's question and answer session. So please submit any questions you have by typing them into your control panel in the space labeled Enter a Question for Staff and clicking Send. We will try to get through as many questions as we have time for. So the first question we have here, the surgery department will not let our SPD staff test insulation of our instruments after every use because it delays the tray turnaround time of some of our trays. What should we do? Well, that, that's hard. That's a hard one. But you know, really where to start with that is you need to gather a meeting together. And that meeting needs to be your best friend. Those, I think the, what was it, 8% of the IP that are on this um, need to be involved in that. Your SPD leadership, your service uh, team leads or service line team leaders uh, from the OR, representatives from SPD and your OR scrubs, you all need to basically sit down and discuss together the issues of not performing insulation testing after every use, as well as giving them a live demo of an insulation tester that you have. And then please use this presentation itself to uh, show the issues and recommendations uh, surrounding um, burns and safety in, um, in the OR room itself. Absolutely. I would just say multidisciplinary committee is the is the term that they like to use. But if you're if you don't have a, a leaked uh, a insulation testing program, um, a risk analysis of whether that's um, believed to be a liability would be something that I, I that's what Sharon is suggesting and with all the key players. Exactly. Thank you both. So really about getting everybody on the same page. Yeah. And so we'll move to our next question, audience question here. Uh, this attendee asks, you talk about different accessories that come with your tester. What if you only have one or two accessories to test the wide range of instruments that we carry? Well, you know, it really depends on um, about your tester itself or what vendor you're buying from with that um, the unit. So you want to reach out to your vendor to see if um, you received all the accessories because I've been in facilities where they just bought the tester and they only got like one accessory and didn't know that they didn't receive the other couple or if there's new accessories added in their line that um, maybe you didn't hear of that you can uh, purchase individually. And if that doesn't work then you want um, to you want to basically evaluate different testers to meet your need in inventory and basically put it against your own tester that you're using and see if those accessories work for your inventory. Great, thank you, Sharon. It looks like we have time for one more question here. So how do you know if your tester is working correctly? Our tester lights up, makes a noise when a failure is found, but is it enough voltage to catch minor damage? That's a very good question. Um, well, first you want to use your biomedical department to evaluate the unit, um, especially yearly. Unless the vendor states from that unit differently in their IFU to send it back to um, back to them for evaluation, 
Um, I would say you also need to review the IFU of the tester to find the correct voltage like we talked about earlier um, for the correct voltage setting for the accessories or maybe it's just a preset standard voltage. Um, you can also do a comparison with two different vendor testers like I'm talking about to see if one is catching minor uh, current strays versus um, just major ones. And that's typically what I'm seeing um, Seth and I when we're going across to hospitals is that everybody in thinks that their tester's working great, like you're saying, the lights uh, go on and it makes a noise. Um, but when we find and we compare it to another installation tester, it's catching, the current tester they have is catching one, and the tester we're comparing it to is catching four different um, failures in the same device. So that would be my recommendation with that. Great, thanks for that clarification. And that's all the time we have for today. I want to thank Sharon, Seth, and Healthmark for the excellent presentation and to our audience for participating today. Enjoy the rest of your day, and we look forward to having you join us for future webinars.